In this video, we're going to be discussing why so many people say they do not like the CAT ACERT engines. Hey guys, this is Joshua with Depth Tape Channel, and in this video, we're going to be discussing the CAT on highway ACERT engines and why nobody seems to like them. Now, when most people say an ACERT engine, they think this engine has a DPF an art head, a crankcase filter, and an EGR system. However, most of the ACERT engines ever produced, as well as most of the ones still on the road today, don't have any of those things. Some of them do, but we're gonna be discussing what the differences between the ACERT engines are, and between the differences between the pre-ACERT and the ACERT engines, as well as the different engine models, okay? So let's get into it. Okay, so before we start talking about all these engine models and what all this means, we need to understand what is ACERT. ACERT is an acronym which stands for Advanced Combustion Emission Reduction Technology. ACERT, A-C-E-R-T. Now, what does this term mean? It doesn't really mean anything. It's basically a label that CAT put on their 2004 and later, meaning up to 2010 when they stopped production, diesel engines. Truck engines, that is. Now, why did CAT need this ACERT technology? What was the big change in 2004? Well, in 2004, the EPA, another acronym, Environmental Protection Agency, really started to monitor truck diesel engine exhaust. Before this time, if your engine ran pretty clean, you know, cleaner than a coal-powered train engine, well, then, it could go in a truck bus or an RV. Starting in 2004 though, they really started monitoring two things heavily. And those two things are PM, particulate matter, and NOx, NOx, nitrogen, nitrous oxides. Now these two things are caused for different reasons. PM, particulate matter, is basically black smoke that you see out of the exhaust. However, NOx, NOx, is an invisible pollutant that is basically formed under high pressure and high oxygen environments with heat. That's basically a diesel engine. So those two things the EPA wanted to reduce starting in 2004. So all the manufacturers scrambled and they had to make changes to their previous engine models. So they had to start making some changes and CAT's decision was to use ACERT. Now, why don't I just tell you what ACERT means? That's because it means different things for different engine models. So that's what we need to focus on now. The first thing we'll start talking about is the smaller engines because very few changes were made to them. The C7 was created in 2004. The C7 is a 3126 that they modified and now it is an ACERT engine. Basically, the block, the cylinder head, and the fuel system are the same on a C7 and a 3126. And the fuel system is a Huey fuel system. It uses a single turbocharger. And there's basically no changes other than the valve cover was redesigned and the injector design is slightly different. It's basically the same fuel system, however. It uses high pressure oil to fire the injectors. It's just the injector solenoid is a little thinner. Now, there are a lot of little changes to the sensors and the wiring, but for the most part, no components were added to the C7 compared to the 3126, it's basically the same engine and the same fuel system. Now, speaking of small engines, there was a new engine model in 2004 known as the C9. C9 did not exist before 2004 in the truck market. The C9 is kind of like a beefier C7. It uses a different block with removable wet liners. It uses a different cylinder head. However, it uses a single turbocharger. It has no emissions items on it. Uh, there's no EGR cooler or anything like that, and it uses a Huey fuel system. It's very similar. However, it's a larger engine displacement-wise. It's 9 liter, and it can make up to 400 horsepower, whereas the C7 can only make up to 350 horsepower. Mostly an RV engine, although some trucks did get the C9. So let's get through what CAT calls their heavy-duty engine line. So two new engine models were created, basically, and one was heavily modified. The C11 and the C13 were created in 2004. All C11 and C13s are ACERT engines. Now, before this, there was a C10 and a C12. Now, the C10 and the C12 
use basically the same cylinder head and the same cylinder block as the C11 and the C13. However, there were a lot of external and internal component changes. Obviously, the displacement changed from a 10 to an 11 liter and from a 12 to a 13 liter, but they also changed the overhead design. They switched from the intake and the exhaust being on one side of the head. They went from an external fuel rail to an internal fuel rail in the cylinder head. And instead of being a single turbo, they went to a compound two turbo system with a pre-cooler. So a lot of changes from the C10, C12 to the C11, C13. Now, what about the C15, which is the biggest heavy duty model? Well, it, one is the name. You may not have ever noticed this, but the pre acer C15 was actually a C-15. Starting with acer it lost the dash, so it's just now a C-15. You may have never noticed that, but it's true. So. What did they change between the C-15 and the C-15? Well, the displacement changed slightly. It went from 14.6 liter to a 15.2 liter. It used basically the same cylinder block and the same cylinder head, the same valve train design outside of the rocker arms. Um, but basically what they started adding were a compound two turbo system, a pre-cooler, and outside of that, externally to the engine, not a lot of changes. However, on all the heavy duty engines, C11, 13, and 15, they added something called IVAs or VVAs, depending on what literature you are reading. Okay, so they made all these changes, at least on the heavy duty models. They really didn't make hardly any changes on the smaller engines. Why did they do this? Well, remember, they were trying to reduce two things, particulate matter and NOx. And those two things aren't really related. They need to be attacked different in different ways to reduce each one and so one of the things they did was even though the injector design didn't change really from model year to model year from pre-acert to uh, acert they changed how they programmed the injectors instead of a four digit code to setting it was now a file so it was a more complex tweaking of the injectors all the c7 c9 c15s 11s and 13s all have what they call a trim file instead of just a trim code. So you actually have to program each injector. Now that's a really little tweak. It doesn't make a big difference. What they really did was in order to get rid of black smoke, particulate matter, you have to always be in a lean condition, which generally diesels are running in a lean condition, unlike gasoline engines. However, during changes of a gear, acceleration, heavy load, sometimes it can get into the rich category and once you start burning more fuel than you have air for, you get black smoke. So how best to do that? Well, you could cut back on fuel, but then you're losing horsepower. And we don't want to do that. We want to create the same amount of horsepower with the same displacement engine. So what's the best way to do that? Well, if you don't want to cut back on fuel, you have to add more air. If you have to add more air, that means more boost. Now, how do you make more boost? Well, Kat's idea was, let's put another turbocharger on there. And boost levels went from generally the high 20s on high 20s to maybe the low 30s on their single turbo engines, like the older C-15 and 3406s, to now the Acer C-15 was pushing the high 40s, maybe even the low 50s in boost. Now this creates a lot of boost, which helps you get going fast and keeps the particulate matter down. So that's good, right? We have now dropped the PM. So we've attacked one of the strategies the EPA wanted. However, by doing that, you're creating another problem. And the reason you're creating another problem is because what was the other item they had to reduce? NOx, nitrous oxides. Now, how are nitrous oxides created? Well, you need an excess oxygen environment, high heat, and, that's, and high pressure. Well, how did we get rid of the black smoke? We added extra oxygen and extra pressure. So now we've taken, we've dropped the black smoke, but we've increased the NOx. So they needed a way to reduce the NOx. Now reducing NOx is not as easy as reducing particulate matter because you have to take something away. You have to take away either heat or pressure or oxygen, but you need all those things for combustion. So one way to do it, and how many manufacturers attacked this, was they added something called an EGR system, which is exhaust gas recirculation. Now there's many problems with this system. Basically you're dumping exhaust 
fumes, exhaust gases back into the intake, which creates a lot of problems with carbon and heat getting into the intake, which is a mess. Not only that, there's usually an EGR cooler to help cool the exhaust air getting back into the intake, and those plug up and they crack, and there's a lot of problems with them. Cummins had problems with those, as well as International. Basically, anyone that uses them has problems with them. Well, if you noticed on the pre-2007, Cap didn't use an EGR system. They came up with a very ingenious, however problem-laden design called the IVAs or VVAs, which we hinted at earlier. Now, what these are, it's basically like a Jake solenoid. It's an oil, it's an oil pressure feed electronically controlled solenoid over the intake valves. And what happens is, since the cam lobe controls when the intake and exhaust close, and you're putting more air and more pressure into the cylinder, there has to be a way to somehow get some of that air out of the cylinder if you want to. And there's really no good way to do that. That's why CAT came up with the IVA system, which basically, when the ECM wants to, it can hold the intake valve open longer. So as the piston comes down and the cylinder is drawing air in, the intake valve is supposed to close at the bottom of the stroke. However, the IVA can hold that valve open longer. So as the piston starts to come back up, it can help relieve some of that intake pressure and oxygen out of the cylinder, which will help reduce NOx. The IVA and the VVA systems were the bane of the ACERT engines. They have and continue to have a lot of problems, mostly because you are relying on the, the intake valve actuator to always fire appropriately. It has to have a setting, just like your intake and exhaust valves and your jakes do, and the wiring to them seems to always fail or wear out, and you start getting codes with them. It's a very common problem on the ACERT engines. Now remember, these aren't on the smaller ACERTs, they're only on the 13, or the 11, the 13, and the C15s. And while they are problem laden, it is good that you don't have an EGR cooler. Basically, you gotta pick your poison. Did you want an IVA system or an EGR cooler? That's really your pick. Basically, the EPA set the mandate and that was CAT's fix. Now those are basically all the changes from the pre-ACERT to the ACERT engines. Now you might be thinking like, well, that, that's not that bad. You'll still see a lot of ACERT engines out there. Most RVs have a C7 or a C9, and a lot of the two turbo designed C15s are still running around. They, they last a long time. The real problem started in 2007. So in 07, the EPA came back and said, hey guys, you know, you did a good job in 04 of getting those emissions down but we're gonna need you to basically reduce all those emissions to zero. You can do that, right? Okay, let's not make it zero. Let's make it basically zero. We don't want any black smoke. We don't want basically any knocks. And oh, while you're at it, give it a blow by two. We don't like that either. So remember, we're talking a three year span here to get all these engine changes in. So. You know, cattle engineers got together and said, okay, well, you know, we got to further reduce these things. We've already added the IBAs and the two turbos. You know, what else are we going to do? There's really not much else we can do. We can't change the piston or the cylinder or the injectors that much to get rid of all these things. So well, what do we do? Basically, they had to just start bolting on and adding all bunch of stuff to the outside of the engine, mostly the exhaust system and the intake system to further reduce these emissions. Now, we need to break these up into categories or else it'll get even more confusing than it already is. So let's focus on getting rid of the black smoke first. This is particulate matter, soot and ash, basically. So in 07, basically all heavy duty diesel engines had to get something called a DPF, which is a diesel particulate filter. Now what this filter does, or what it is, is it catches all the soot and all the ash coming out of the exhaust stream, all the black smoke. And it does a very good job of this. Now this filter is basically a big muffler with a ceramic honeycomb inside that catches all this soot and ash and it holds on to it. Doesn't let it out the exhaust stream. It works well. They are very expensive though, several thousand dollars. But the problem is with any filter, what happens over time? They get plugged. And as they get plugged, you get an exhaust restriction, which is bad for the engine. It reduces your power. You start getting all sorts of other problems. So. You have a couple options at that point. You could take the DPF off and replace it. You could take the DPF off and have it professionally cleaned. All these options are fairly expensive. 
Or how about we can cook the soot, since it's soot is unburned fuel, basically has to be cooked at around 1,100 degrees, 1,087 degrees Fahrenheit to be exact. And it's hard to get that amount of heat to the DPF, which is several feet away from the engine, consistently. So Kat said, okay, well, what if we artificially add a heat source to the exhaust stream? Other manufacturers did this as well. The CAT system used something called an ARDHEAD, an ARD, After Treatment Regeneration Device. More acronyms. Now, this ARDHEAD is almost like a small cylinder head. It has two fuel lines that feed it. It has a fresh air system giving it oxygen. It has a spark plug and a spark plug wire. It even has two coolant lines that go to it to help keep it from cracking from overheating. And the problem with this system, while it does work well, it, it does increase the exhaust heat when it needs to and it helps clean out the DPF, is that the art heads fail all the time. Now, what do I mean by all the time? They don't fail every week. It's more like every year or two they fail. And the downside with this is they're fairly expensive. They are about $1,000 to $1,500 in parts, plus labor to replace them. Not only that, when they fail, they start throwing codes out. And these codes generally cannot be cleared by the driver. They have to be cleared with dealer factory passwords, which means you generally have to get a towed or call out the dealer and have them clear the codes and then fix the problem and then do a regen. So it ends up costing you not only in downtime and loss of load, but many parts and many labor expenses. They're very expensive and very complicated system. Cat on their truck engines never really fixed this design. They never got it right to where the art heads last super long time. I have seen a couple art heads of been on there a while but in general they are not a reliable part and that is one of the main reasons people got a bad taste in their mouth was the art head system now remember that was just to deal with the particulate matter there's also the two other items you need to learn about let's focus on the knock system now remember the way it cat dealt with that initially was their iva slash vva system to help reduce the cylinder pressures and the amount of oxygen in the cylinders to reduce knocks this alone was not cutting it though for the 07 product so cat had to eventually use what they call in well use an egr system they had to pull exhaust gases and dump them into the intake now why does dumping exhaust gases into the intake reduce nox remember nox needs heat pressure oxygen what's something missing in the exhaust stream oxygen so you're taking gas where the oxygen has basically been converted into carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, and you're dumping it into the intake, so you're reducing the amount of oxygen load in the combustion cycle. Now, if you type in EGR in the CAT parts or CAT technical information system, known as SIS, service information system, nothing will come up. There's no EGR. What are you talking about, EGR? I don't know what you're talking about. CAT is special in some ways they don't call it egr they call it cgi now i'm not talking about like a bad star wars graphics here i'm talking about clean gas induction cgi now why didn't cat just call it egr everyone else calls it egr the reason cat did not call it egr is there is a difference most egr systems pull exhaust gases off the exhaust manifold or somewhere on the exhaust by the turbocharger and then run it through a cooler and dump it into the intake the downside of that is there's a lot of soot, remember black smoke, in that exhaust field stream that is getting plugged up in your EGR cooler and in your intake. So what's a way to get rid of the soot? Well, it has to be exhaust. Hey, we just added this DPF. It catches all the soot. So Cat decided to pull the exhaust, not from the exhaust manifold, but way downstream after the DPF. It actually pulls it off the back of the DPF. And this was actually a really good idea. CAT CGI systems actually have very, very, very few flaws in them. They don't fail very often, unlike the art heads. So CAT pulls the exhaust off the DPF after it's been cleaned by the DPF. It then sends it into the intake and it, it works. It works. It doesn't have as many problems as some of the other engine systems that use DGR because it doesn't have the soot in there. Now, unfortunately, they also kept the IVA system, which is still a problem-prone system. In my opinion, however, I'm not an engineer. 
I think they should have dropped the IVA system, gone to strictly the CGI system, made that work. It would have simplified the engine somewhat. Cat did not do that, however. They kept the IVAs and added the CGI. So just made a complicated system more complicated. Now remember, there was a third emission that the EPA also wanted reduction in, or basically zero emissions out of, and that was the blow-by. Blow-by on these engines is always just vented to atmosphere, so it is an emission. But the way CAT handled this was two different ways. So on the C-13s and 15s, their heavy-duty line, CAT dropped the C-11 and 07. So you just had a C-7, C-9, C-13, C-15. On the 13s and the 15s, they went to a crankcase fumes disposal unit, basically a crankcase filter that needs to be replaced, uh, every, like every other oil change, basically, or every oil change, depending on how much blow-by you're getting. And that was how they got rid of that. Now, that did increase the crankcase pressure because you're now filtering it. So these engines tend to leak a little bit more. On the C7s and C9s, however, they went to a closed crankcase system that vents the crankcase fumes into the exhaust. No filter, no filter to change. Good idea. However, the fitting that screws into the exhaust on these tends to plug up over time with soot and burned oil fumes. And it'll, it'll actually close off or restrict very heavily. And then you start getting a lot of crankcase pressure. I mean, imagine if you just close your blow-by tube. You would start getting so much crankcase pressure, you're going to start getting leaks. It might push out a, a seal. And the biggest seal that would fail on these was in the turbochargers. Now, CAT had redesigned the turbochargers on the C7s and C9s to help boost, boost pressure during the regens, which is when the art head is heating up the DPF. And they went to something called a VGT, another acronym. Variable geometry turbo, and these turbos are more expensive, harder to remove and install, and they fail more often. And basically, they're worse turbos all the way around for their C7 and C9 systems. Not only that, the crankcase fumes disposal unit having more problems because they'll tend to plug up would push the seals out on these turbos, and then they'd be pushing oil, and they would just fail even more often. Not only that, they didn't have a reman option for these turbos, so they were more expensive to replace because it's not something they could reman. Now, the 13s and 15s, they didn't really change the fuel system very much. Outside of, they went to a dual solenoid, um, dual solenoid setup on their injectors, but other than that, pretty much the same fuel system. The C7 and C9, though, they completely redid it. Not only they did all these other changes, they decided, hey, uh, let's just redo the whole fuel system while we're at it. So they went to a common rail system, which made it a lot more complicated. So now instead of a Huey system, you now have a high pressure common rail fuel pump, you have external fuel lines, you have a external fuel rail, you have cool tubes that go through the head, you have a different injector design, you have something like five uh, fuel pressure regulators on the C7s and C9s. They, those engines are so much more complicated than the previous C7s and C9s. It's, it's almost scary. People say they don't like the Acer engines. Generally, it's the 07 Acers that they're talking about. And as you can see, there's a reason why. They had a lot of problems, okay? Thanks for watching.